Dr. Farah Jawad, uh, who is a sports and exercise medicine consultant, a colleague of mine at Pure Sports Medicine in London. Um, and we've asked her to come on because she did her research um, for one of her postgraduate uh, qualifications in seasonal variation in vitamin D in ballet dancers, which we think is pretty pertinent to the, to the foot and ankle. So Farah, thank you so much uh, for joining us. And uh, maybe we will just kick off if, if it's okay with you, if you could just give us a really brief summary of, um, of your research and what it entailed and the sort of things you found. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I did my research for my master's project a few years ago on professional ballet dancers at the Royal Ballet um, in London looking at um, seasonal variation in vitamin D. Um, uh, so I think, you know, several years ago, they identified that um, they had a tendency to get vitamin D insufficiency or deficiency. And then they decided to um, look at this over uh, the sort of winter to spring period and see if there was a difference. And then um, uh, they were uh, subsequently put onto a protocol of vitamin D and, and my, my project was looking at how that varied the level of vitamin D that they when they had blood tests how it varied over the seasons and um, I looked across sort of uh, three or four years um, uh, to have a look and see were they also um, affected by a seasonal variation in vitamin D which we wouldn't expect that they would be because they live in London um, and actually I found that um, in the first year, they they were affected by by the seasonal variation that we would expect. But then, as time went on, that seasonal variation seemed to affect them less. And uh, I hypothesised that that was because of the vitamin D protocol that they were on, because that, that perhaps they were building up sufficient stores of vitamin D to to see them through the winter. So that was my 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 project, which I really enjoyed. Yeah, it sounds fascinating. And we definitely want to take some of that and um, try and ask questions around it and apply it to our to our usual demographic of patients uh, across yeah. across the country. And this may well be uh, more of a seasonal UK thing right now than it is for Craig and, and his listeners and our Australian listeners, for example. So there's definitely going to be some geographical bias from <clears throat> myself and Farrah being based in London, obviously. Um, but before we get to the sort of the levels and, and and the testing and whether we should supplement and what this may mean for injury risk if anything could we yeah. could we go back a step um and sort of talk a bit about um what vitamin d is and and why we think it's so important in the first place i.e what sort of body systems uh, is it suggested to benefit the most yeah vitamin d is really important you know it has a vital part in our bone metabolism um it helps our body absorb and and use calcium which gives our bones strength and 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 hardness um and it also has a role in muscle strength um it increases the number of of type 2 muscle fibers so it has an anabolic effect on on muscle um it's crucial for preventing rickets in in children, which is, uh, you know, uh, soft and weak bones and the equivalent disease in the adult is called osteomalacia. Um, and, you know, vitamin D deficiency can lead to those two conditions. And vitamin D can also help prevent falls in the elderly, probably because it helps with muscle strength. And it may have um, a, various different roles in our uh, immune system. Uh, as well. Um, it also, it, because it's so essential for normal bone metabolism, you know, it's helpful in the context of bone healing and callus formation if one has bony injury. So, you know, it really has uh, uh, far reaching uh, effects on, you know, a, a different uh, aspects of our um, of our health. Yeah, and, and sitting here as someone who works within musculoskeletal medicine, as I know you do, some of the some of the body systems you mentioned there, it, it feels incredibly um, incredibly key to the sort of patients that we may well be seeing. Bone injury, you know, we mentioned bone, we mentioned muscle, we think of the injuries we see. Um, yeah. So that, that hopefully that kind of gives us the link as to why we're doing this this episode and how we're trying to convince podiatrists we should we should at least uh, re listen a bit more about this kind of thing. Um, where do we derive our vitamin D from? Because I recall many many years ago someone saying to me. Uh, the only place you can get it is from the sun. And obviously being in England, we, we might not get enough of that. Um, uh, and if you're not getting it from the sun, you need to get it from supplementation. Can we get any from our from our diet? I mean, wh wh where, where can it be derived from? 
Yeah, um, so the majority of it we do get from our sunlight exposure. Um, so uh, the, the UVB rays hit our skin and, uh, you know, we, we um, uh, create vitamin D in our skin and then it, we, we get lots of different forms and, you know, it goes via the liver and the kidneys and all different uh, uh, by all different pathways. The majority of it we do get from our sunlight exposure and a small amount we get naturally from our diet. One of the challenges of vitamin D is that our dietary sources of, of it are few. So the places where we can get it naturally are oily fish, um, eggs, some pork products, lamb's liver. You know, of course, if one's a vegetarian or a vegan, those um, are not not appropriate options um uh, so it means that in some scenarios obviously people may require supplementation great so it's not it's not totally accurate to say that we cannot derive vitamin d from from our diet it sounds like so clearly the sun is the big win but we yeah. can we can sort of tweak our diet in our favor too by the sounds of it yeah we can um uh it's we need both of them you you know we can't um it, it wouldn't be sufficient to you know live in complete darkness forever and you know sit eating uh oily fish for example you know we do need the sun exposure but yes you're right we we, it's, we need both of them really it just just a, just a just a general question before we get down to specifics what about those people that live in environments um in certain arctic areas that don't get sunlight for like months of the year how do they survive are they i presume they're on supplements are they or yeah gosh you know well i guess they eat a lot of oily fish because they have, <laughs> yeah. they have fish available yeah. to them um and my goodness you know the answer is i really don't know i don't know about those populations i don't know if they're more prone to certain conditions or not uh gosh that's an interesting question i'm so sorry mm. that i don't know yeah no i i, I just it just struck me then <laughs> yeah well it's well, just struck me too <laughs> i'm just I'm so uh sorry. I'm just delighted that you've you've thought of somewhere that gets you know less sunlight than we do here in England. That makes me feel <laughs> just a tiny bit better about myself. Um, so before we come on to um, sort of uh, some of the stuff we've talked about in a bit more depth, it sounds like vitamin D deficiency should all, it, we should almost expect it to be common. Certainly at certain times of, in the northern hemisphere in the winter, as we are now, um, we should expect it to be common. Do we have? any prevalence incidence data on how how common this is um is that sort of are those numbers available yeah so you're quite right you know in in winter uh we are reliant on our vitamin d stores and our dietary sources you know to keep adequate levels of vitamin d and the, the problem is that if you live at a latitude of higher than 37 degrees north or lower than 37 degrees south. So that basically means Northern Europe and above and uh, sort of uh, Victoria, New South Wales in, in Australia, the north of Auckland, the lower part of Chile, you know, that, that those are the sort of cutoffs where from October to March, there are not enough UVB photons coming down from the atmosphere to help us synthesize the vitamin D in our skin, which means, in those winter months, it is not possible to make vitamin D from our sunlight exposure. Um, and so what what that means is that for people who live at those latitudes and above, that we are more likely to get vitamin D deficiency. Um, uh, in terms of uh, data of how frequent, not frequent, sorry, how, how common that is, um, you know, I've, I found something in my preparation for this podcast, which said in the UK, maybe one in five people may have vitamin D deficiency. That doesn't include people who are a bit insufficient. Um, and of course, I think that's the one in five is probably grossly underestimated because, of course, you know, it's a very difficult thing to make an estimate for. Certainly anecdotally, if I might speak anecdotally, when I test vitamin D for, for patients, it is unusual to, for me to find them that they are replete. It is usually in people who, you know, are already taking supplements already that they're in the sort of replete group. So, you know, I think the scale of the issue is a big one, especially at the 
uh, latitudes that I mentioned. Yeah, actually, Farrell, while you were commenting then, I just quickly Googled um, vitamin D latitudes under images and there's heaps of maps i won't put any up but there's there's hundreds of maps out there with the with the vitamin d risk you know on on a map of the world is where you're higher risk i was quite surprised how much yeah. there is <laughs> yeah it is it's quite it, it's quite interesting hmm. so let's take uh, where we are in in december in london for example um and then you know we we or you know if, when we're not in a pandemic and we're not working from home, the usual scenario for most people would have been to wake up in the dark, uh, to commute to work in the dark, to get to the office. If they're really lucky, they might get some some daylight with a window, but some of our clinics certainly uh, don't have those. Uh, you sit in an office with with you know artificial light all day, and by the time you're you're packing up clinic and heading home again, or, um, you're travelling home in the dark again. Um, with that in mind and with what you've just mentioned about just just how how sort of uh, common we think this is um is it reasonable to function under the assumption that someone is vitamin d deficient until proven otherwise is that a reasonable stance and and, and part two to that question if you're seeing someone in your clinic or if any of us are seeing someone in our clinic with muscular or bone injury at this time of year in the northern hemisphere for example um should testing vitamin D be done as, as 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 a baseline test for everyone? I know there are no blank. We don't like blanket approaches here, but I'm just yeah. sort of um, playing devil's advocate there. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, I don't like what blanket approaches either. They always used to teach us at medical school. I don't know if they do this at podiatry school. If the question says always or never, the answer's wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the answer is um, it depends. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. It depends. So my answer is it depends. Um, no, I don't think we should blanket test everybody for vitamin D deficiency. It's not a good use of resources. It's that would be expensive. Um, is it reasonable to assume that people may have a tendency to have lower vitamin D? Yes, I think it is reasonable. I don't think we need to subject people to blood tests to, to figure that out. Um, also, uh, Public Health England, their current recommendations are that um, uh, everybody in the UK would benefit from, or at least in England, you know, whoever, what, what, what they're referring to, um, everybody in the UK would benefit from a vitamin D supplement of, um, uh, I think, is it 10 micrograms a day, they suggest. And, you know, that, that's been their advice since 2016, because they assume that vitamin D deficiency is very common, and that is a small supplement. You know, it's, it's low enough that if your vitamin D is low over time, you will build up your stores. Um, and it is, you know, it's very difficult to overdose on vitamin D. It's not impossible. Um, but, you know, it's a safe thing to take in general if you, one doesn't have comorbidities. Um, and, you know, they are cheap. Vitamin D supplements are cheap. You can buy them, you know, shop's own brand for, for you know, not much at all, as right. as, as shown by Craig. <laughs> a massive, a massive, massive tub well, there for someone. Yeah, in actually, Ian, I think, I, think, I think we've screwed up here. We should have got a sponsor for this episode. We could have got I a know. good one. <laughs> I know, <laughs> my goodness. No. <laughs> Got ourselves some supplies. So to uh, to quickly just vault off of that question, um, just in case, I'm always worried that that, that people um, misinterpret the messages we're giving, and I'd, I'd hate for yeah. someone to be watching and to be thinking, okay, so vitamin D is common, and it's the winter time, and it's dark, and it's cheap to buy, and it, it's impossible to overdose, or not impossible, but very difficult to overdose on, yeah. and we don't need to subject them to blood tests. So I'd hate I'd hate for a podiatrist watching. To go into clinic tomorrow morning, see a query tibial stress injury, and say, you know what, head to Holland and Barrett. Uh, other health health food stores are available, um, but head head to the local health food store and just pick up some vitamin D. What what words have you got to? I mean, first of all, is is that is that completely inappropriate, or is that okay or reasonable to do? Or what words of discouragement would you have for someone who would say, okay? every bone injury I see for the next three months, I, as the podiatrist, am going to recommend vitamin D. Why, why, would, why should we kind of discourage that kind of uh, gung-ho approach, if, if indeed we should? Ye right, yeah. So in multivitamins, which contain vitamin D, a lot of them contain vitamin D, they usually have around 10 to 15 micrograms of vitamin D. So, you know, if one is a, a healthy person, 
without any other medical problems, whether you have a, a foot injury or not, it would be safe for you to take a multivitamin that contains a small amount of vitamin D. That is, you know, a reasonable thing to do. Um, but um, vitamin D in high doses, particularly in the kind of doses that a doctor might prescribe to remedy vitamin D deficiency quickly, can sometimes unmask um, other more serious uh, things um, like something called primary hyperparathyroidism, which is a, a dysfunction of calcium metabolism, um, uh, which is rare, but, you know, can still happen. That, that tends to happen with high doses prescribed of vitamin D rather than, you know, a small amount that's, you know, one can obtain from a multivitamin that you don't need a prescription for. Um, so, you know, it's a tricky one, I think. I think it would be, it's hard for me to say because I'm coming at this as a doctor and and so, um, I don't know, I've got the luxury of easily doing blood tests on my patients, you know, and, you know, chin scratching and all of that stuff that doctors <laughs> want to do, I like to do. Um, so, you know, it's a tricky one. I'm, I'm sorry, I, maybe I'm not answer, really answering your question. I think, I think, look, in a, in a healthy person who doesn't have comorbidities, um, Anybody can take a multivitamin that contains vitamin D, 10 to 15 micrograms. It would be all right to do that. Um, I think if you've got someone with a foot injury, say, sorry, you've got someone with a stress fracture of the foot, for example. <clears throat> well, you might want to actually, uh, if they're, particularly if their healing is a bit um, delayed or if they have recurrent fractures, you think something else is going on, you know, then one might want to involve a doctor, for example. Um, and, and in a scenario like that, that is often when I would test the vitamin D, because if the vitamin D is very low, well, I'm, I might want to bring it up quite quickly if there aren't any contraindications. And then I might um, uh, then consider prescribing and then, you know, a prescription dose to bring it up quickly as a much higher dose. And, and you know, if I do that, I have to check a blood test for the patient um, within four weeks to make sure I haven't caused any bone metabolism, uh, bony metabolism problems. So, so yeah, I hope I've answered your question, Ian. Yeah, yeah, can I, absolutely. Can I just, uh, can I just ask? Say, say someone had an undiagnosed, you know, very mild deficiency. Is there enough vitamin D in a in a typical multivitamin to 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 to, boost that. to work with a mild one? Or yeah, yeah. So. So it depends how low it is. Over time, mm. it will go up. Yes, it will. Yeah. But it might take some time. Okay. All right. Yeah. yeah. Cool. And if, uh, if they have a current problem, we don't really we want it to be fixed now. We don't really necessarily want to wait months for it to come back up. Yeah. yeah that's, that's my personal uh, practice. Yes. <clears throat> Right, so let's talk a bit about the foot. Uh, forgive our forgive our uh, unashamed bias, of course. Um, we, 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 can't, we can't escape the, the influence of vitamin D on bone health. I think that's the first thing that comes to most people's minds. And yeah. at foot, foot level, particularly through the winter, um, we potentially see a certain sort of group of in, or cluster of injuries. Now, you could argue, particularly at this time of year, we've normally got people uh, training for the spring marathon. So that could be a, a, a sort of confounder here. But but generally speaking, if we see bone stress, we, we have a raised suspicion of bone stress, bone injury, stress fractures, anything on that continuum um, in the winter, it wouldn't be unreasonable to think bone injury in the winter, particularly in the absence of any increase in load, maybe we're dealing with so, sort of a vitamin D uh, deficit sort of uh, consequence here. What I want to say is that the, the anecdotes there are all well and good and they make sense. They make biological sense. But when we look at the evidence, the, the, the foot and ankle evidence specifically, um, I know you're more than aware than most that, that it's it's not perhaps as, as, as wide and vast uh, as, a, as an evidence base as it could be. And I know we all recently just had a chat about the, the, the review um, pertaining to vitamin D in the foot and ankle. Um, Craig probably put a link in the comments. It's Mel Hotra and colleagues. Um, it was just four or five months ago in, in JAPMA. Why is there such a discrepancy between the kind of biological plausibility of, of bone health being a problem? And we know that the foot is particularly susceptible to stress, bone stress injuries. Yeah. Uh, why, why is the evidence kind of really, really supporting, uh, you know, VIT D deficiency and, and its risk for foot injuries in, in, in a really strong, robust way? Yeah. OK, there's a, 
quite a few things that I want to say. It's great, go for it. And the first um, is that you you mentioned about winter and running injuries and stress fractures and vitamin D. It's important to just make, I want to make the point that vitamin D deficiency and indeed calcium deficiency as well, because really we mustn't talk about vitamin D without mentioning calcium, which is its, you know, bedfellow. Um, uh, that vitamin D and calcium deficiency, like, do not make osteoporosis. Do you know what I mean? Osteoporosis is not a calcium and vitamin D deficiency uh, issue, not a primary de deficiency issue, but ca having sufficient dietary calcium and replete vitamin D is, is important because for osteoporosis and uh, uh, because it will, uh, you know, help to normalise bone metabolism and also having replete vitamin D is important in the context of people who are on special medicines for osteoporosis. And that's the first thing I wanted to say about that. You know, it's not simply that having low vitamin D makes us more likely to get stress fractures. It's like one small piece of the puzzle. You know, um, there's there's the load factor, of course, which is the, a big one. Um, and of, and uh, relative energy deficiency, of course, might may be another relevant uh, uh, factor with that too. Um, and so, so you know, there are other factors involved. And then you mentioned, you've asked me about, you know, why is there a bit of a poverty of data? I think that's what that's what you're asking me, isn't it? It, it is, uh, yes. Yeah, um, there is a poverty. <laughs> data I, I i have a um a, a, you know this I idea why which is that there are so many factors that are involved in um in uh, vitamin d uh, and its synthesis so my goodness you know list them I, I think i haven't even got enough fingers to list them all you know one is sunlight and our sunlight exposure where we live on the planet um the, the, our skin color because having darker skin like mine is a natural sunscreen so you know it means that I might need longer in the sun to synthesize the same vitamin d as say someone like Craig uh, what else are there um there is your you know your your pre-existing stores so vitamin d is is not like vitamin c if you have too much vitamin c you're weird out Vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin. So if you take supplements, we store it in our body fat. So that's another thing, not just how much stores we have to begin with at the start of the year, say, but what's our fat mass like? If we've got too little body fat, um, we, then we may not have the sufficient stores of vitamin D, for example, theoretically. There's also some evidence that in people with obesity that they can also be subject to low vitamin D. Now, I, you know, we don't really know why that is. I think there's a theory that it, the vitamin D may become sequestered in the fat. And then I think maybe it becomes difficult to get out into the, to the, to the blood. Um, I think that's one theory. Um, so, you know, sunlight, diet, pre-existing stores, fat mass. It seems like there are some genes that are involved as well in in uh, vitamin D synthesis and degradation. Uh, I think three genes have been named and possibly a fourth as well. So it means that even within populations, we may have differences in the way that we, um, uh, you know, create and process our vitamin D. Um, uh, our, whether our sport is inside or outside, or or uh, do we train indoors or outdoors? What what job do we do? You know, do we um, uh, dress very modestly and cover up? Um, uh, all of these things um, have uh, are, are contributing factors, and and uh, the other thing as well is, of course, there are people if they have um, certain conditions that cause them to be in a malabsorptive state. Um, say, you know, perhaps people with inflammatory bowel disease, for example, um, then or, or celiac disease, then they may also be potentially subject to, to vitamin D deficiency. And uh, the other thing to mention as well is that, um, well, it's a bit it's a bit rarer and maybe is not relevant to your question. But, you know, people with kidney disease, liver disease can also have problems with vitamin D, too. So to answer your question, Ian, there are so many factors that are involved with 
vitamin D levels. The, all these things affect vitamin D levels. So it means the problem we have is that when we're trying to do studies, how do you control for all of these things? You know, there are so, it, you can't control for all of these variables in the studies. Um, uh, there are so many wide ranging factors. And actually, when I read the Mal Hotra paper that you kindly shared with me, um, that I think you've put the link uh, uh, somewhere for the viewers to see, I really sympathized with them when I read their paper because it reminded me of when I was doing my own literature review, <laughs> which is on a similar topic because I was also looking at athletic populations and dancers specifically. There is a poverty of information about vitamin D in these specific groups, especially in dancers, unfortunately, or, or there was at the time that I did my, my project. So, you know, with that in mind, it's difficult to control for all these variables. That's the real life aspect of vitamin D metabolism. And actually, maybe that's all right. Maybe it's an asset. You know, people are not uh, uh, in control you know case control studies you know people don't live like that in the real world so actually maybe it doesn't matter too much that you know the studies included in in the review some of them you know are not the um highest level of evidence and that kind of thing um you know it, it's difficult because we can't make conclusions from you know lo uh, low powered studies that have you know high heterogeneity between the studies and the diversity of participants but uh, like that's the world we're living in so you know <laughs> i i hope that makes sense i think that's why it's so difficult that's why the evidence is so mixed because, because how do you control for all these variables it's one of these scenarios you know it's not like not like you've got this cancer drug or nothing you know and you compare the two and you know it's it's just not like that yeah what what i love about your description of some of the factors there is you it's essentially you know a lot of previous guests have said this and particularly our red our, our red s uh, episode as well was very similar it it was almost like listening to sort of some of the things you look for and observe yourself and some of the things you ask in your own history taking um listening to the way you were kind of systematically going through things that contribute i, I almost felt like i got a glimpse into your mind when someone's sitting in front of you in clinic of the the things you're excluding, the things you're thinking, the thing, you know, you're observing what's their, what's their skin tone like, what's their body mass like. They're things that we, you probably do completely matter-of-factly. So I think that's still kind of valuable to know, um, even though we'd love the, the science that really served up, you know, Vit, Vit D uh, gives you this problem at the foot. You know, it's still nice, I think, to get, give people an idea of when things come in, um, start thinking, you know, of, of some of these factors. So, yeah, I think that's really, really useful. Craig, you look like you wanted to say something. Did someone comment on Facebook about something? No, there, look, there was a question here. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know whether you can read that. Uh, about the parathyroid hormone, blood calcium level, closed system will suppress absorption of vitamin D if they're out of balance, giving supplements. And could that cause serious issues? Issue. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So um, uh, this person has, you know, drawn on this issue, which is very important. You know, vitamin D supplements are absolutely not for everybody. There are some people in whom, you know, they should not be used, um, uh, 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 at least not without, you know, the input of, you know, an endocrinologist, for example. So people, you know, who've got hyperparathyroidism or people who have, you know, hypercalcemia, so high level, a high level of calcium in the blood, people who've got hypercalcemia associated with malignancy, you know, that those are people who should not have vitamin D supplements. And, um, you know, people with, with those sorts of conditions, um, you know, they would not um, necessarily go unnoticed you know there are some non-specific symptoms that would go with those those sorts of conditions so you know hopefully they would have sought medical help rather than being a first presenter to the podiatry clinic if you know what I mean yeah let's uh, quickly talk about a, a pragmatic sort of daily life thing let's say that as a as the podiatrist we rightly or wrongly um are going to refer someone on to to one of our sports physician colleagues like yourself um with with a view of getting your 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 opinion your 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 diagnostic workup and as part of that handover as we often do in our clinics where you just kind of casually meet in the corridor we say there's a few things here that just made me wonder whether 
w- whether there may be some sort of deficit in vitamin D. Um, what, what does that process look like in the real world as in if we are referring someone not that we would ever say you're going to you're going we're referring you for a vitamin d test we'd say we're referring you to our 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 colleague our consultant colleague uh, so they can work things up a bit more but if we were going to sort of set the scene for a patient coming to see you for the kind of vitamin d screening slash testing slash supplementation could you just kind of describe to us what that looks like it's one is it one blood test is it a series of tests is there you know, is there much of a wait? Are they are they sort of in and out on the same day with a with a with a pot of pills? What does that look like in the real world? Yeah. So um, obviously, whether or not I do a vitamin D test on a patient is uh, case by by case uh, uh, scenario. Um, invariably, if I'm going to the trouble of testing for testing vitamin D. Actually, often I end up testing other things as well, because it's never just vitamin D I'm thinking about. You know, if people have bony injuries or they've got recurrent bony injuries or, you know, I think maybe there's something else going on here. that's not quite right. Some, you know, some metabolic bone problem or or uh, or if I think something else is going along that might be uh, uh, of a hormonal nature, then I may test bone profile as well, which, you know, uh, tests uh, uh calcium and some other parameters in the blood as well. I might test their thyroid because that also can have a role in um, uh, in bone health. Um, uh, so, you know, there are other things that I might test it for in, a, in a practical sense when I'm in my clinic. You know, obviously I would take a full history and I would examine the patient and, you know, come to my own conclusions. And then if I decide my patient needs blood tests, I usually can do a form for them, which is usually online in my NHS trust you know, it's done on on the computer, and I, I say to them to self present to the phlebotomist, you know, where they queue up, have it done, and then the result, you know, for a test like those sorts of tests, they would come back within twenty four hours. Those results, they come back very quickly, really, within a few hours, really, they come back, um, and I just put the results at the bottom of their letter, and I and I let them know. I like to let them know quickly because if I've gone to the trouble of checking it, particularly something like vitamin D. If I want them to be supplemented, if they need supplements, for example, I want to tell them quickly, especially if it might make, you know, even a small bit of difference uh, to their, you know, the healing of their bony injury, for example. Great. Um, So, again, it's probably a difficult question to answer, but I just want to give our our podiatry listening audience um, some sort of applicable take homes, as as many as we can, if, if indeed we can. The kind of things that, that we would raise our suspicion in clinic that we would see um, that, that may be reasonable things to escalate to our sports medicine colleagues like yourself. Um, yeah. Again, not just because it's the winter and not just because someone lives in the northern hemisphere in, in December, but things like um, suspicion of bone injury that feels like it's on a timeline that is unreasonable. Things like very, very low body mass. Are there any kind of um, is there like a top three where you could say, right, these things you know, in the context of the presenting case might be reasonable flags for some kind of bone profiling, vitamin D screening, etc. Is it that simple? Mm, yeah, I would say, you know, if you have, uh, when do I think about testing vitamin D? That's that's another way I guess I could answer the question. Yeah, yeah, I think about it in patients who have um, bony stress injuries, um, uh, particularly if they've got recurrent bony stress injuries, if I think they may have relative energy deficiency or REDS and that they have a bony injury um, because vitamin D is going to be a play. It's going to uh, play a part in helping to optimize their bone health and, and helping to normalize bone metabolism if they have a bony injury. So it's, you know, it's small print, but it's important. Another time I think about vitamin D um, and it's a bit small print stuff. But because it has um, potentially positive effects on um, muscle strength um, uh, and also contractility of muscles, if a patient has a refractory tendinopathy, you know, not only, of course, does does one have to think about, you know, things like peripheral manifestations of axial spondylarthropathy, you know, rheumatological causes for tendinopathies. I also check the vitamin D because um because if the vitamin d is deficient and they've got a refractory tendinopathy you know and they're kind of not really getting better they're following their rehab 
I think, well, it's really um, easy to check the vitamin D and it's easy and cheap to replace it. And, you know, it might make just that tiny bit of difference. So that's also another group of people in whom I, I consider checking vitamin D. I certainly don't do it for every tendinopathy, you know, but it's it's small print stuff, I think, for the refractory tendinopathy. And of course, you know, we mustn't forget rheumatological causes for those refractory tendinopathies. Perfect. And and supplementation, um, what does it look like? I mean, obviously the dose will be be specific like any like any um like any drug the dose is specific to the to you know what you're treating but you know even with things like paracetamol we know we know generally we're giving one gram four times a day up to one gram four times a day there's there's a range we're working within what's the range that we're working within within vitamin d just so that if people come in and they say to us oh i'm taking that we can kind of say how much are you taking we get an idea of where they are kind of in the um, in the range yeah so um, the kinds of supplements that you can buy over the counter without a prescription range from about, you know, 10 micrograms to, I think, about 25 microgram tablets. So um, a typical multivitamin would have 10 to 15 micrograms. And then you could buy a what what over the counter would call a high dose supplement is about 25 micrograms. Um, but you you know one would really have to take quite a lot i mean you know to far exceed those sorts of doses um uh, to get toxicity you know it, it you you um uh, those lower doses are generally you know reasonable and safe uh, to take you know su these supplements if they are used as as it says on the on the tin uh, and they're used in sensible doses, you know, they're very unlikely to cause harm. Um, the other thing is, of course, you know, vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin. So, you know, we, we make if we take a bit too much, it gets stored, if you like. Um, uh, but, you know, there is a threshold um, and the threshold is quite high. Um, yeah. Too much vitamin D. I mean, really, um, uh, it, it, you'd have to give someone quite a lot of vitamin D to, to to do that, or they'd have to be taking maybe more than than it says on the box. Yeah, uh, sure. And tox sorry, Craig. Quick last question while it's in my mind: toxic vitamin D toxicity. How yeah. might that? How would that manifest? Um, yeah. So the problem is the problem, unfortunately, is if you if one does end up with too much vitamin D, is that you can get hypercalcemia, and the problem with hypercalcemia is that. Uh, sometimes the symptoms, well, they are, they can be horrible, uh, but they can also be quite non-specific. So, you know, people can get things like uh, vomiting and um, they might uh, uh, get depression or confusion, um, you know, hormonal pain, um, uh, kidney stones. So, you know, there, uh, it, uh, it's one of these things, you know, people don't walk through the door and say, I've got hypercalcemia, but, you know, they can become very unwell. And those people would usually... Uh, 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 be compelled to to see a, a, um, to seek medical help because they really wouldn't feel very well. Great. I just I just checked this this one that a friend takes. It's at twenty five micrograms per, per per tablet over the yeah. over the counter. Yeah, the, so it's the high end here. Yeah, that's it. You, a, friend, a friend has to take that. <laughs> get a few of those in Craig um let's <laughs> let's uh we far from we're, we're far from us to sort of try and ride some kind of controversial wave but um let's talk about coronavirus if, if we can um just because it's dominated just because it's dominated our lives for all of 2020 um Craig keeps abreast of of one of Craig's hobbies you know most of us like to spend time with our family or go for a run Craig likes to seek out pseudoscience on the internet and pick fights <laughs> Craig t t talk to us Craig about what you've found um with your searches uh, recently about vitamin D and and how it's the the messiah for for covid-19 no well, I, I, in, in fairness like you, if you from what I, my superficial review of the literature and evidence is that there is some very good evidence of a very strong correlation between vitamin D deficiency, um, the extent of COVID-19 symptoms, the outcomes of COVID-19, but that's it. It's, yeah. a, it's a correlation. Yeah. You go to some of the alternative health websites, they are now suggesting that vitamin D is a potential cure for COVID-19. <laughs> and that, that pattern repeats itself 
so many times over the years and so many different pathologies um, and, I, and I get quite frustrated. Now, the, the, to me, if someone has COVID-19 and the vitamin D deficiency, it makes common sense to supplement them. But it, it, there's no evidence that that's related to a better outcome. Or Now, now it may well be, but I, I think it's, the, it, it's interesting just following this pattern of correlations to this is the cure is what really, really was what my beef is. <laughs> Yeah, I um, I think it's my beef too. You know, I really sympathise, Craig, because mm. it's so hot. Actually, I sympathise with um, uh, everybody, really. I tell you why. Because <laughs> in this age where we are, you know, subjected to so much information and mm. a lot of people because of their, um, uh, you know, just because of their background or what they do, you know people maybe don't know how to critically appraise that information it's really difficult you know um i mean you know even when uh, i look at if i read, read a research paper i've got to read it a few times to look at the methodology and you know you have to critique it you know these things you know take a bit of time and a bit of effort so you know people poor people really because everyone's bombarded with so much information it's hard to make uh, a head of the pain of it of course you know you're quite right i think um, when vitamin D is so prevalent uh, in in certain communities because of where we live and because of all the other factors that I mentioned, well, I mean, no wonder that uh, many people with coronavirus or people that have suffered with um, uh, with a more severe illness have a tendency to have you know lower vitamin D. I don't think that that's you know that surprising, mm. or um, and certainly as far as i'm aware there is no good evidence to say that supplementing yourself with vitamin d will you know uh, make one have less of a severe uh, uh, illness with coronavirus the advice from public health england has been um you know unchanged on vitamin d since 2016 so since 2016 they've said that everybody would uh, where we live would benefit from taking a multi -vit a, a vitamin D supplement 10 micrograms a day because we are probably going to be vitamin D deficient and it's very difficult to tell who is going to get enough sunlight exposure and and their advice now in the coronavirus pandemic has been the same presumably because now of course we've had to stay in a lot more you know life has become quite different um, and uh, vitamin D deficiency causes problems for people, causes bone problems and causes, you know, weak muscles. Um, so, yeah, it's important for us to m make sure that we're replete in vitamin D. Uh, and it's in that's important during this pandemic, but maybe not for the reasons that some of those uh, people you're 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 mentioning uh, are, are saying, you know, it's not for those reasons. It's for other reasons. Yeah. Actually, perhaps closer to home and getting back towards the foot or lower limb, I am aware, I, I just quickly I look for them, of three studies that have shown a correlation between vitamin D deficiency and growing pains in kids. Now, the if you look at the geographic location of the authors, they are in areas where dietary deficiency is probably quite high. But yeah. nevertheless, there's three studies that have showed a vitamin D deficiency and there's one study um, which on the surface looks reasonably good of using vitamin D supplementation in kids with growing pains and the recommendation was perhaps we should be supplementing kids who've got growing pains with vitamin D but if you look at in the details of the study um, all those that were included were actually deficient in vitamin D <laughs> so yeah. the and, and if you look at some especially some kids health websites you do see vitamin D recommended as a treatment for growing pains Yet yeah. the, ev the evidence is three correlational studies in areas where there's high dietary deficiency and one study in which the kids were vitamin deficient anyway. <laughs> um, so that's, that's what I'm talking about in this COVID thing, that there's some big, big leaps are being taken. Um, and uh, again, I, I, I don't just have an answer. I mean, it's hard, you know, people will respond saying, well, what's the harm? <laughs> yeah, <it's, laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. I think what, what the harm, there's always a harm, isn't there, in in misinformation? Um, mm. uh, but um, you're right. You know, uh, the other the, the there's a harm in misinformation. But vitamin D supplements are cheap. Uh, if they are used yeah. judiciously, then they will yeah. are unlikely to cause problems. Um, you know, I think it's got to be sort of dependent, really. <laughs>
Yeah, I mean, I, I would hate for anyone to go out and start prescribing vitamin D supplements for growing pains in kids based on what I just said. You know, like there's more to yeah. it than that. But of course. The, the other, the other, we have focused a lot on um, um, bone injury, but there's probably, and I just did a quick count, I think I've been able to very quickly locate 18 studies uh, correlation between vitamin Ds and diabetic foot ulcers. And again, uh, again, all correlational studies. Now, whether the, the, Demand for vitamin D goes up when someone has a, a foot ulcer you know, due to the inflammatory process. I, I, you know, I don't know enough to comment on that, but there is obviously similar issues going on there within, you know, with our, our diabetic foot colleagues. That there is, a, you know, a lot of work showing correlations. There are a couple of supplementation studies in diabetic foot ulcers, but again, they were in journals with zero impact factors. So you sort of don't know how much weight to give these interventional studies. But on the surface, I mean, you know, I haven't reviewed them in detail. They, they look okay. So I think there's a lot more to it than just bone stress injuries. You know, maybe a correlation with growing pains in kids. There's um, diabetic foot ulcers, the correlation there. You know, yeah, so it's um, I, correlation. Sorry, Craig. Yeah, no, you're right. Yeah, I finished, yeah. No, sorry, I was just going to say, I think, you know, the growing pains in kids, I mean, obviously one always has to be very um careful when mm. children have pain and symptoms you know one has to be yeah. you know always have a low threshold for suspicion uh for uh, pathology um mm. for serious pathology as well and um you know vitamin d and and aches and pains uh, they go together quite well vitamin d and diabetic false foot ulcer you know it's kind of harder to to make that connection really um you know we know that vitamin d may have a role in our immune system but you know i would say in the diabetic foot infection uh group you know there are other factors obviously that that are much more significant you know that also you know can you can are they controlled for in those studies with vitamin d you know that the glycemic control of the patients you know any pre-existing neuropathy you know um how mobile they are you know, those are confounding factors, um, which I would argue are probably more uh, more significant than, you know, vitamin D. Yeah. Um, just actually on the site, if, if someone does have an infection, yeah. like, I don't know enough to, to would, could that increase the demand for vitamin D and lead to the deficiency? Uh, no. Oh, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Nice firm, uh, uh, quick answer there. Nice answer. You like yeah, answers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we, the best answer so far. Um, yeah. Craig, yeah. Craig uh, conscious that we're we're getting close to the hour, is there anything yeah. uh, pressing no, that, that, on, no, on that, Facebook? No. I, I saw one comment from a good friend of mine when I was mentioning about bad uh, bad levels of sunlight in London. A very, very close friend of mine recently moved to Abu Dhabi and he sends me WhatsApp pictures. Oh, here he is, Fitzy. He sends me whatsapp pictures almost daily of his feet by the pool i'm getting pretty <laughs> sick of it i'm getting really sick of him to be honest and sure enough here he is mentioning abu dhabi once again so yeah it's, it's, <laughs> thank you thank you for that mate um but no other than other than him with his humble brag was there any anyone else that um had anything no. to say no lots just 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 a few complimentary comments about how good it is <laughs> no, I, great so no, we're all off to take our 10 10 micrograms of vitamin D to be more vigilant about these things, uh, to try and get out in the sun when, when we get sun. Um, and like I say, this is a winter thing here, but I guess it doesn't matter where you are in the world. At some point, it's going to be winter. So you need to be vigilant about this stuff, right? Except yeah. every device. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> at, the, at the relevant latitudes, yeah, absolutely. You know, our lucky friends maybe in the Middle East don't, don't have the wintry problem that we have. Ex-friends, ex-friends. <laughs> really important you mentioned yep. about vitamin d supplement please don't forget calcium because there's no point having the adequate vitamin d without sufficient dietary calcium it's very important um and the other thing i wanted to say which i didn't mention before is we must protect our skin from the sun you know this message about the sunlight from me is not um does not uh, uh, equate to please go out and bask in the sun you know obviously the, the sun is really very harmful for us um irradiating our skin and, and giving us high risk of of skin cancers and and aging as well which you know we don't want so um we only need a little bit of sun exposure 10 to 15 minutes um on our face uh, hands and and legs 
a f you know, I think it's two to three times a week or something that will help us to make the vitamin D. So, you know, it's not a lot. You don't need a lot. And right. of course, it's only in the, sp in the spring to autumn time at the latitudes like where we live in London. Perfect. So be safe in the sun. Please. <laughs> daily, daily vitamin D, low dose vitamin D with a supplemented calcium and move to Abu Dhabi. Is what yeah. we're here, what I'm hearing here. Yeah, get your calcium from your diet rather than from, from supplements. Supplements can cause problems, calcium supplements. Avoid those if you can. Have nice dietary sources of calcium, much safer and much Perfect. better for you. Brilliant. Great. Sure. Uh, Great. Uh, thank no. you so much. Thank you so much for your time. It's been brilliant. And such an yeah, honour. Thank you so much. I really right, enjoyed it. Great. Right. Thanks, Farah. Thanks, Ian.